Good evening, Larson Heights, and welcome back to Bedtime Stories with Mrs. Schatzko. We are currently in the middle of reading Holes, um, and Stanley and Zero just got up to the top of Big Thumb. Oh, look in the background, you can see our friend Losha just cuddling in for a nice nap. Hopefully he's good to us and does not bark at us. Um, and we will start on with chapter 40. When Stanley found the onion the night before, he didn't question how it had come to be there. He ate it gratefully, but now, as he sat gazing at Big Thumb and the meadow full of flowers, he couldn't help but wonder about it. If there was one wild onion, there could be more. He intertwined his fingers and tried to rub out the pain. Then he bent down and dug up another flower, this time pulling up the entire plant, including the root. Onions. Fresh, hot, sweet onions, Sam called as Mary Lou pulled the cart down Main Street. Eight cents a dozen. It was a beautiful spring morning. The sky was painted pale blue and pink, the same color as the lake and the peach trees along its shore. Mrs. Gladys Tennyson was wearing her nightgown and robe as she came running down the street after Sam. Mrs. Tennyson was normally a very proper woman who never went out in public without dressing up in fine clothes and a hat. So it was quite surprising to the people of Green Lake to see her running past them. Sam, she shouted. Whoa, Mary Lou, said Sam, stopping his mule and cart. Good morning, Mrs. Tennyson, he said. How's little Becca doing? Gladys Tem Tennyson was all smiles. I think she's gonna be all right. The fever broke about an hour ago, thanks to you. I'm sure the good Lord and Doc Hawthorne deserve most of the credit. The good Lord, yes, agreed Miss Tennyson, but not Doc Hawthorne. That quack wanted to put leeches on her stomach. Leeches, my word. He said they would suck out the bad blood. Now you tell me, how would a leech know good blood from bad blood? Well, I wouldn't know, said Sam. It was your onion tonic, said Mrs. Tennyson. That's what saved her. Other townspeople made their way to the cart. Good morning, Gladys, said Hattie Parker. Don't you look lovely this morning? Several people snickered. Good morning, Hattie, Mrs. Tennyson replied. Does your husband know you're parading about in your bedclothes, Hattie asked. There were more snickers. My husband knows exactly where I am and how I am dressed, thank you, said Mrs. Tennyson. We have both been up all night and, a half, with the, and half the morning with Rebecca. She almost died from stomach sickness. It seems she ate some bad meat. Hattie's face flushed. Her husband, Jim Parker, was the butcher. It made my husband and me sick as well, said Mrs. Tennyson, but it nearly killed Becca. What with her being so young, Sam saved her life. It wasn't me, said Sam. It was the onions. Hmm. I'm glad Becca's all right, Hattie said contritely. I keep telling Jim he needs to wash his knives, said Mr. Pike, who owned the general store. Hattie Parker excused herself, then turned and quickly walked away. Tell Becca when she feels up to it to come by the store for a piece of candy, said Mr. Pike. Thank you, I'll do that. Before returning home, Mrs. Tennyson bought a dozen onions from Sam. She gave him a dime and told him to keep the change. I don't take charity, Sam told her, but if you want to buy a few extra onions for Mary Lou, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. Mary Lou, she comes back. All right then, said Mrs. Tennyson, give me my change in onions. Sam gave Mrs. Tennyson an additional three onions and she fed them one at a time to Mary Lou. She laughed as the old donkey ate them out of her hand. Stanley and Zero slept off and on for the next two days, ate onions, all they wanted, and splashed dirty water into their mouth. In the late afternoon, Big Thumb gave them shade. Stanley tried to make the hole deeper, but he really needed the shovel. His efforts just seemed to stir up the mud and make the water dirtier. Zero was sleeping. He was still very sick and weak, but the sleep and the onions seemed to be doing him some good. Stanley was no longer afraid that he would die soon. Still, he didn't want to go for the shovel while Zero was asleep. He didn't want him to wake up and think he'd been deserted. He waited for Zero to open his eyes. I think I'll go look for the shovel, Stanley said. I'll wait here, Zero said feebly, as if he had any other choice. Stanley headed down the mountain. The sleep and the onions had done him a lot of good as well. He felt strong. It was fairly easy to follow the trail he had made two days earlier. There were a few places where he wasn't sure he was going the right way, but it just took a little bit of searching before he found the trail again. 
He went quite a ways down the mountain, but he still didn't find the shovel. He looked back up toward the top of the mountain. He must have walked right past it, he thought. There was no way he could have carried Zero all the way up from here. Still, he headed down. He came to a bare spot between two large patches of weed and sat down to rest. Now, he definitely had gone too far, he decided. He was tired out from walking down the hill. It would have been impossible to have carried Zero up the hill from here, especially after walking all day with no food or water. The shovel must be buried in some weeds. Before starting back up, he took one last look around in all directions. He saw a large indentation in the weeds a little further down the mountain. It didn't seem likely the shovel could be there, but he'd already come this far. There, lying in some tall weeds, he found the shovel and the sack of jars. He was amazed. He wondered if the shovel and sack might have rolled down the hill, but none of the jars were broken except the one which had broken earlier. And if they had rolled down the hill, it's doubtful that he would have found the sack and shovel side by side. On his way back up the mountain, Stanley had to sit down and rest several times. It was a long, hard climb. Chapter 41. Zero's condition continued to improve. Stanley slowly peeled an onion. He liked eating them one layer at a time. The water hole was now almost as large as the holes he had dug back in Camp Green Lake. It contained almost two feet of murky water. Stanley had dug it all himself. Zero had offered to help, but Stanley thought it better for Zero to save his strength. It was a lot harder to dig in water than it was in dry lake. Stanley was surprised that he himself hadn't gotten sick, either from the sploosh, the dirty water, or from living on onions. He used to get sick quite a lot back at home. Both boys were barefoot. They had washed their socks. All their clothes were very dirty, but their socks were definitely the worst. They didn't dip their socks into the hole, afraid to contaminate the water. Instead, they filled the jars and poured the water over their dirty socks. I didn't go to the homeless shelter very often, Zero said, just if the weather was really bad. I'd have to find someone to pretend to be my mom. If I'd just gone by myself, they would have asked me a bunch of questions. If they'd found out I didn't have a mom, they would have made me a ward of the state. What's a ward of the state? Zero smiled. I don't know, but I didn't like the sound of it. Stanley remembered Mr. Pendansky telling the warden that Zero was a ward of the state. He wondered if Zero knew he'd become one. I liked sleeping outside, said Zero. I used to pretend I was a Cub Scout. I always wanted to be a Cub Scout. I'd see them at the park in their blue uniforms. I was never a Cub Scout, said Stanley. I wasn't good at social stuff like that. Kids made fun of me because I was fat. I liked the blue uniform, said Zero. Maybe I wouldn't have liked being a Cub Scout. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. My mother was a Girl Scout, was once a Girl Scout, said Zero. I thought you said you didn't have a mother. Everybody has to have a mother. Well, yeah, I know that. She said once she won a prize for selling the most Girl Scout cookies, said Zero. She was real proud of that. Stanley peeled off another layer of his onion. We always took what we needed, Zero said. When I was little, I didn't even know it was stealing. I don't remember when I found out, but we just took what we needed, never more. So when I saw the shoes on display in the shelter, I just reached in the glass case and took them. Clyde Livingston's shoes, asked Stanley. I didn't know they were his. I just thought they were somebody's old shoes. It was better to take somebody's old shoes, I thought, than steal a pair of new ones. I didn't know they were famous. There was a sign, but of course I couldn't read it. Then, the next thing I know, everybody's making this big deal about how the shoes are missing. It was kind of funny in a way. The whole place is going crazy. There I was, wearing the shoes, and everyone's running around saying, what happened to the shoes? The shoes are gone. I just walked out the door. No one noticed me. When I got outside, I ran around the corner, and I immediately took off the shoes. I put them on top of a parked car. I remember they smelled really bad. Yeah, those were them, said Stanley. Did they fit you? Pretty much. Stanley remembered being surprised at Clyde Livingston's small shoe size. Stanley's shoes were bigger. Clyde Livingston had small, quick feet. Stanley's feet were big and slow. I should have just kept them, said Zero. I'd already made it out of the shelter and everything. I ended up getting arrested the next day when I tried to walk out of a shoe store with a new pair of sneakers. If I had just kept those old smelly sneakers, then neither one of us would be here now. Have a great evening, Larson Heights. I cannot wait to see you in the morning.